Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Welcome back young friends. Today we're looking at the Parabhava Sutta and this is in Sutta Nipata, chapter 1, discourse number 6. This is a very important sutta, particularly from a young person's perspective, because there's much that one can do when you understand or hear the Buddha's teaching on what causes downfall. You can make wiser choices around how to prevent and preempt things that bring downfall. And in many ways, you can observe what other people are doing and, and see downfall and realize that that's not for you. So this particular sutta comes because some devas, having heard the Mahamangala Sutta, when they asked the Buddha, what brings the highest blessings? They then asked the Buddha, what brings downfall to a person? So they came to Jetha's Grove and they asked the Buddha. And the Buddha outlined 12 different actions or qualities that bring a person's downfall. So in Pali, Parabhava actually translates as downfall or ruin, decline, even degeneration, disgrace, defeat, destruction. And in many ways you could say it brings disaster. And so if you want to know what is the recipe for disaster, then it's these 12 things. In listening to this teaching of the Buddha, I think one of the things to bear in mind is the world that we live in is currently going through a lot of disaster, a lot of ruin, a lot of challenges. And if you go with what's happening in the world, so what you read on the news, what you see in social media, what's happening in your schools and in your communities, if you go with what everybody else is doing, then what you can see is it will lead to, to ruin. And what's very important is that if you have any conviction in the Buddha, if you see his teaching as something that is very helpful, either in your meditation or in daily life, that if there's anything that you've learned from the Buddha that, that you respect and, and you see is valuable, then you'll take this particular teaching and really strive with it, really see and investigate and, and find out for yourself is what the Buddha says is true. And when you do, then you know that you want to keep the precepts and be more cautious around who you make friends with and, and the type of things that you associate with. And so that is how this particular teaching can be very helpful because what the world needs right now is more people that are courageous and brave enough to go against the world, to go against the flow of perversion, crime, deception, greed, hatred, and most of all, delusion. So let's begin. The sutta starts with the devas coming to the Buddha and asking him, what is the cause of a downfall for a person? And the Buddha's first answer is, one who succeeds is easily known, one who falls down is easily known. One who loves the Dhamma is successful but one who detests the Dhamma falls down. So a very simple way of looking at this, particularly if you've been following the Anupubhikata, the gradual teachings of the Buddha that we've been going through together, then the easiest way of understanding this is if you follow the Dhamma, you love the Dhamma because you, you love what the Buddha is teaching us, that he is teaching us that there is wholesome and there is unwholesome. There is generosity and there's stinginess. There is karma and rebirth. If you understand even these three things about what the Buddha teaches, then you know, actually, it's important how we live our lives, how we conduct ourselves. And so someone who understands that is successful because they become generous. They want to be generous. They want to keep precepts because they know virtue is very important. And they do that because they understand karma, that our volitional activities through body, speech and mind have an impact. There is a result of those things. So if you want to be successful, then you heed the Buddhist teachings in this way. Now, what brings downfall, how you fall down, is if you detest the Dhamma. You don't want to know about virtue. You don't want to know about being generous. And you deny or you don't know about Kamma, that there is a a result to our actions, that there are ramifications. 
And so what you can see is if someone goes along and doesn't keep their precepts and is stingy and has all the defilements, all the mental stains and then all the wrong kinds of uh, speech and wrong kinds of actions, then that would bring downfall. So that's a very simple way of looking at it. So anyone who is in Dhamma, who's trying to learn what the Buddha is teaching and sees the value of it, sees the benefit of it, then it won't bring downfall. But if you really hate it and you want to live your life exuberantly without any care in the world, thinking that there are no ramifications, then that is what brings downfall. After they heard the first downfall, they understood and the devas asked the Buddha again, what is the cause of a downfall? And in the second instance, the Buddha says, the bad are dear to him. He does not treat the good as dear. He approves of the teaching of the bad. That is a cause of a downfall. So in this second one, what the Buddha is saying here is that one is interested in all the bad things. So when you're young, there is social pressure to do certain things. Now, some people are not very interested in it, and that's a good thing. But if you hang out with the wrong people, then what happens is you get pulled into things. Or if you yourself have a very strong tendency, then you, you lead others towards that. So these could be things like drugs, alcohol, making fun of people, bullying people, hurting people, physically fighting with people, being very uh, dominant and domineering with your your speech and worse. So there could be promiscuity, drugs, uh, all the perverse types of things. You could get hooked onto pornography. So that is what it means when the bad are dear to you, that you, you start to want to gravitate to things which are not good for your mind, not good, it doesn't bring out good things with your speech and definitely not with your actions. And so when that happens, you don't treat the good as dear. That means you don't incline towards wise people. You may even be mean or, or bully good people. And you may, at worst, disrespect people who are having a love for the Dhamma, who are living the upright life. You ridicule them, demean them. And so what happens is when you associate with the bad, whether it's bad things or associate with people who are into bad things and you're willing to be led in that direction, then you start to approve of everything that is said about those things. And in that way, the, the crux of it is that you lower Dhamma and you raise all the bad things higher than Dhamma. And that's quite natural because when you're in, in the sort of bad situation, you prioritize all those bad things. You're more interested in what's happening on the internet, all the bad things that people are doing. You're not really interested in all the goodness in the world. And so that brings downfall because you're polluting your mind and you're really compromising your virtue. And so we know from Buddha's teachings that there is a karmic result of that. If you speak harshly to someone, there's a result of that. If you lie, there's a result of that. If you hurt people, there's a result of that. We've seen that when we've gone through the Vatupama Sutta. So this is the second downfall. And I think one of the things with the second downfall is this is the opportunity to be sure that you pick the right friends. We often think that we need friends, any friends. But with this second downfall, what the Buddha is alluding to, trying to tell us, is to pick our friends very wisely. And if you read the suttas, there are times where he says it's better not to have bad friends at all, better to be alone, because the karmic ramifications of it are very bad. And if you hang out with bad friends and you see them doing bad things, they can only take you down. So in the Singhalobhada Sutta, the Buddha talks about six drawbacks of bad friends. And what he says is, you become friends and companions with those who are addicts, carousers, drunkards, frauds, swindlers, and thugs. These are the six drawbacks of bad friends. Now, when you're young, you can start to see inklings of this, little signs of this, because, you know, when you go to school or college, university, the culture is often drinking culture, drug culture, 
uh, lying and, and cheating and things like that, they start to begin. And those are the people that the Buddha advises be very cautious of making friends with people like these because they can only bring your downfall. Like in the first instance with addicts, we know through looking at the world that addicts don't end up in a very good place. Addicts end up falling into disgrace, which is what Parabhava is about, this particular sutta is about. Carouses, that means you go out late at night to all the things that are not good for you and end up very tired and all kinds of other things come from that. Drunkards, you never really see good behavior from people who are drunk. You see all kinds of not so nice behavior. Frauds, people who pretend and then who deceive others. Swindlers, people who take other people and swindle them. And then thugs, people who get into fights. So. This is something to bear in mind that if you don't want to go down, if you want to succeed in life, then you want to be very careful who you associate with. When the Buddha says not to associate with bad friends or wrong company, there's certain reasons for that. And sometimes we say to ourselves, oh, but they've invited us, so we'll go along. And so even though we know that their behavior is immoral, it's corrupt, it's it's something that's suspect or they hide things. We think, well, we'll go along, but we'll protect ourselves. We'll stay guarded, but it's okay if we still hang out with them. And the Buddha has this very important teaching called the Jiguchita Sutta, where he actually says, even though one does not follow the example of such a person, a bad report still circulates about oneself. And the report says, he has bad friends, bad companions, bad comrades. Just as a snake that has passed through feces, though it does not bite one, would smear one. So too, though one does not follow the example of such a person, a bad report still circulates about oneself. He has bad friends, bad companions, bad comrades. Therefore, such a person is to be looked upon with disgust, not to be associated with, followed and served. So this is clearly that people can perceive you, tie you with the same brush. So just like the feces, that if you hang out with the wrong people, you'll still be smeared. The smell will still be there. So if you don't wish to be associated with people who are drunk, taking drugs, people that cheat other people, people that cheat on their partners, like do all kinds of not so good things, then it's really important to bear this in mind because it will bring downfall. People perceive you differently. If you want to succeed in the world, you don't want to associate with those types of people because that smell will, will follow you. It will follow you when you go to look for a job. It will follow you when you want to uh, maybe take a public post uh, in the future. If you want to be successful in that way, if you want to lead in the world, then you can't afford to be uh, following these types of people. And it does take a lot of courage and, and bravery to go against that. There's a lot of peer pressure, but there is something very important about it that one must contemplate for oneself. And so that's where Buddha's teaching becomes very valuable to look at your peers to look at the people around you, to look at the people such as your parents, such as your parents' friends, to look out into the world and see who is looked down upon. And it's really people that associate with the bad and who believe the wrong things. They end up in a bad place. So when you're young, you can observe that. You can see who has marriage breakdowns, who falls from grace, who gets ridiculed in public, who loses all their wealth, who is successful and then falls? You can observe, you can see. And so when we go through these, all the 12, you'll see, ah, oh, I, I recognize that. So when you're young, the beauty of it is you can choose more wisely. When you see the evidence for yourself, when you investigate for yourself, you can choose more wisely and then you can be more successful in the world. 
Having heard and understood the Buddha's answer to the second downfall, the Devas then asked the Buddha again, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says in this third answer, if a person is lethargic, gregarious, and does not make an exertion, indolent, and one who displays anger, that is a cause of a downfall. So with this third one, it's pretty straightforward. If you're lethargic, you want to be a couch potato, gregarious, you're always socializing and wasting time, and you don't make an exertion, so you don't apply the energy when it's needed, and indolent, so you're getting very lazy, and then one who displays anger. You get angry over small things, like even when someone says, maybe you should go and study, maybe you should go and do some work, or they ask you to help them out around the house. So that's the cause of a downfall, is because you don't apply yourself when it's needed. So when it comes to studying, you loll about, you waste time, you don't apply. And then when it comes to the exams and the assignments, you fall short. Same with work. You get a reputation for not applying energy. You're lazy. People are unwilling to ask you and you're put on notice. You might lose your job. So when you look out in the world and you ask yourself, who is successful? Largely, it's people who are fortunate enough to apply energy when it's needed. So they applied themselves to their studies. They applied themselves to their work and they kept succeeding. They kept moving up. Now, the people in the world that fall from grace, who don't succeed, who never make a success of themselves are the ones that never apply themselves, indulge in laziness, too busy wasting time. So this is what the Buddha is talking about. And largely it's that you keep the mind dull, you keep it with the defilements. You're too interested in bad things really, because even indulging in television or getting wasted or taking drugs, it does make you very lethargic and waste time and, and not feel like you want to apply yourself. So it's linked to the second downfall. And it's really also linked to the first. All of these are linked to the first when you don't understand you know, what to prioritize in the world. The Buddha talks about six drawbacks of laziness. So he says, you don't get your work done because you think it's too cold, it's too hot, it's too late, it's too early, I'm too hungry, I'm too full. By dwelling on so many excuses for not working, you don't make any more money and the money you already have runs out. These are the six drawbacks of habitual laziness. So when it comes to studying, Clearly, if we waste so much time making excuses, we either run short of time and don't do so well, or even worse than that, we fail at what we're studying. And when it comes to work, if we make so many excuses and we're trying to run a business, be an entrepreneur or something like that, then you'll never really succeed because things will not get done. Or if you work for someone, we all know that nobody wants to hire someone that's lazy you'll get pulled up at work. And if you keep showing laziness and indolence or even displaying anger, people will fire you and it'll become difficult to get work. So you can see that you can't make any more money or even if you obtain money, somebody gives you money, you inherit money, then at some point due to laziness, that money will run out and it'll be difficult to get more. So these are the things to bear in mind. At any age, laziness can set in. At any age, indolence can set in. So it's something that one has to bear in mind all throughout life to make sure one applies to oneself. Even when you're applying yourself to spiritual practice, just as an example, one needs to make effort. It's such a huge part of Buddha's teaching because when you allow indolence and things like that, you're actually allowing hindrances, sloth and torpor, something we've spoken about before. We also call it dullness and drowsiness. It overcomes the body, becomes weak, and the mind is also very dull and, and heavy. So whenever you want to do something, you need brightness in the mind. You need to be able to energize oneself. And so that's in another direction. Successful people are able to do that. And so that's something to bear in mind. If you don't want to fall down, then you need to overcome these kinds of things.
Having heard and understood the third downfall, the devas then ask the Buddha again, what is the cause of a downfall? And the fourth answer that the Buddha gives is, if one who is able does not support his mother or his father, when they grow old, their youth gone, that is a cause of a downfall. So this one is really about when your parents get older, being able to give them support, helping them out, being able to look after them, serving them. And this is really because of gratitude and thanks for all that they've done for us. And to remember that they're really our first teachers. They're the ones that taught us how to walk, how to talk, and how to look after ourselves. And this is a very strong part of the Buddha's teaching that it's important as our duty to look after them. And so we can start doing this early that if we're still young, it's good to lend a hand. Like if our parents ask us, can you help me to do this? Can you come with me to the supermarket? It's good to, if we have the time and the ability to actually help them when we can and not to feel that they have to force us. Because sometimes what happens in, in today's world is, is we can't really be bothered or we're too absorbed in what we're doing. But it's really good to show some support to parents because sometimes what we don't notice is how much financial stress they're under, how much they're worried about certain things. And maybe it's to do with their relationships and things at work or other things. So one of the things that we can do is to start early, to start honoring our parents, not wait until they're old, because by the time they're old, if we turn away, we don't even want to look at them. We don't even want to come and help them. When they call us and they say, I need this, could you, could you help me with this? And we say, no, it's an awful position to be with. And sometimes what happens, particularly with older people and their parents, is you can only conditionally support them. You'll only do certain things for them on your terms. And that's not very nice because if you look at when we're young, our, our parents have never said, oh, we won't, won't do that. Most good parents will bend over backwards and beyond, even when we're older, to actually help us out, lend us money, give us a place to stay when, when things go pear-shaped. So it's just something to bear in mind that most people will frown upon if they find out that you, you don't help out your parents, you don't uh, look after them and, and you... Don't do the right thing by them. And it's very much part of Buddha's teachings to, to take care and to respect people who are older than us. One of the examples that the Buddha gives in the suttas is about Saka, king of the Devas. Now, when he was a human being, he took seven vows, which when he achieved them, he achieved the status of Saka. So the sutta says, when a person supports his parents and respects the family elders, when his speech is gentle and courteous, and he refrains from divisive words, when he strives to remove meanness, is truthful, and vanquishes anger, the Tavating Sadevas call him truly a superior person. So that's one example. Another example is Gatikara. He lived at the time of the Buddha, Kasapa Buddha, so not Gautama Buddha, but Kasapa Buddha. And he was one of the preeminent lay disciples of the Buddha. The Buddha would go to his house even when he wasn't there and he was able to take alms food, things like that. And he was someone who didn't ordain, but he was looking after his aged and blind parents. So you often see people who are very worthy role models who have such qualities of taking care of their parents in old age. Having heard and understood the fourth downfall, the devas again ask the Buddha, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha says, if one deceives with false speech, a Brahmin or an ascetic or some other mendicant, that is the cause of a downfall. So with this fifth downfall, the Buddha is specifically referring to people that have higher virtue. So they could be lay people or monastics and discouraging deceiving them with false speech. So lying and deception. Now we know there are bad results when you lie. You can be falsely accused is what the Buddha says in the Ducharita Vipaka Sutta. But also, you just imagine 
Do you like it when people lie to you? The answer is obviously no. We never like it when people lie to us or when they deceive us. And so the same thing applies here that the cause of a downfall, particularly with people with higher virtue, is not to deceive them, not to lie to them, not to promise things that we can't do, not to promise to give them things that we can't fulfill and give. So always bear in mind that if we don't like something in another person, such as lying and deceiving, then it's very good encouragement for us ourselves internally to say, we wouldn't want to do that to anybody else. And in this instance, you fall from a greater height when you do that to somebody with higher virtue. You develop a bad reputation by going back on your word, by not fulfilling what you promised. And so people think you're unreliable, you're a liar, a cheat. So that's what brings downfall. Having heard and understood the fifth downfall, the devas ask again, what is the cause of a downfall? And the sixth that the Buddha says is, if a person with abundant wealth, endowed with bullion and food, eats delicacies alone, that is a cause of a downfall. So this is very much about stinginess, and we've spoken about stinginess before. It's one of the mental stains. So when you think about stinginess, this is a person that doesn't want to share. And in this particular example that the Buddha is talking about, when you're wealthy and you hide it, you don't share it with anybody else and you eat alone. This is a particular tendency that can start from young. So it's very good to start being generous. We know this is part of the gradual teaching, to be able to give. When you're able to give, it means you're able to give up, to be able to think about another person. So as we've said before, when we've talked about these qualities, you turn it around by looking in the mirror and saying, well, do I like being around somebody who is stingy? And the answer is no. You know, if somebody has something they don't want to share, you know, they have something really nice, and they don't want to share, you look at the person, you think, this person is not good. And so the same thing applies that downfall comes when you have these stingy qualities, because in future, people don't want to help you, they blame you, they shun you, they accuse you, they directly accuse you of being stingy, it's not a good thing. So when you're young, it's important to recognize stinginess is a cause of downfall. And if you don't like that quality in somebody else, it's very good not to encourage it yourself. Now, when it comes to food and eating alone, it's because you want to hide it. There are uh, stories in, in the Buddhist teachings about people not even wanting to share with their family, not wanting to share with their wife or husband. That's how bad it can be. And when you think about when you're wealthy, you have enough money to share it around, to take your family members out for meals, to take your employees out for celebratory meals, things like that, to care for people. And that is a good quality to have, to remember that to be successful is to share. Particularly when you have more, you have the ability to share more. And so what brings downfall is the quality of stinginess. Having heard and understood the sixth downfall, the devas then asked the Buddha again, what is the cause of a downfall? And the Buddha's seventh answer is, a person proud because of social class, proud because of wealth, proud because of clan, looks down on his own relative. That is a cause of a downfall. So with this seventh downfall, it's pretty much looking at the stubbornness and the pride, the arrogance that comes because of a worldly yardstick. Things like social class, wealth, the family that you're born into. So this can come in many ways. So when you're young, it's not so prevalent, but it may be there because if your parents have this, sometimes it rubs off on you where you think you're better than others. And so you're very proud of, of certain things, but in a misguided way. And as you grow up, sometimes this can seep in. And I think this is where you need to be a little careful. So say, for example, you do really well in future that your family comes from maybe poverty or maybe middle class, and you make it so that you're so successful out of hard work and maybe also a bit of luck. And when you look at your family members and they haven't been as successful as you, you turn around and you look down on them. 
and you look down on them because you're wealthy. So this is one of the examples that the Buddha is giving. The other example could be you get the opportunity because of your parents' hard work to go study abroad. And you go study abroad and what happens is when you come back, you've developed all these things because you've seen things abroad. It's more advanced or they have a different culture and there's certain things that you like. And so when you come back to your country and your country doesn't have those things, maybe it's a little backward or, or maybe it's a little bit more simple or maybe there are other issues there. But when you come back, the worst thing that you can do is look down your nose just because you went to study abroad. You look down at your relatives who didn't get that chance or friends who didn't get that chance. So that's what that can smell like. And there are other different examples of this. So it's just something that when you start to do that, you forget who helped you. You forget, particularly say if it's your parents, if they helped you and then you come back and you think you're better, whatever it is, if you've done better and you look down, you forget the people that helped you and they could be family members, they could be friends, they could be other people. And so it's always to remember when you succeed, don't bite the hand that has fed you. Don't look down on people in the wrong way. Now, what's really interesting is Buddha says that if you have this kind of quality, like pride, obstinacy, arrogance, then what you can expect as a karmic result is you would be reborn, if you're reborn as a human, into low birth, low class family. So this is really quite smelly. And if you think about even looking in the mirror, that it, do you like somebody who behaves like this? He's very arrogant and proud because of wealth, social class, even at school, university. If you meet people like this, do you like it? Do you like how they behave? The answer, of course, is no. And so if you see that, that's another way of saying, well, maybe I don't want to be like that now or in the future. So because it brings downfall, people end up despising you and they end up cursing you in many ways because they would not want you to succeed. And if you've succeeded, they want you to fail because you've got this kind of bad smell around you. It's not very nice. Having heard and understood the seventh downfall, the devas then asked the Buddha about the eighth downfall or cause of a downfall. And the Buddha's answer is, a womanizer, one fond of liquor, addicted to gambling, dissipates whatever he has gained. That is a cause of a downfall. So Buddha is really talking about drains on wealth. There are other suttas that talk about four drains on wealth. And the first three are this womanizing, fondness for liquor and addicted to gambling. And the fourth one is having bad friends. So when you develop a tendency towards associating with bad things and associating with bad company that encourage you in this way, or you go together in this way, then what it leads to is downfall. So when you're young, it's very good to prevent yourself from developing bad habits like this. The social pressure is to party, to blot your mind, to just indulge, because that's what you're meant to do. But it really leads to quite bad things. Now, the propensity right now is always to go to the pub, to indulge in liquor, and to seek out lots and lots of different companions, male or female. And then gambling is also another thing. But the idea is to know that a lot of these things, what happens is you end up spending a lot of money. When the Buddha says you dissipate whatever you have gained, it's like turning on the tap and all your money gets drained. The Buddha has this simile of a large reservoir. It has four inlets and four drains. And he says that, if you were to open up the drains and close off the inlet, so nothing else comes in, but things go out, and then there's no rain, then what happens is you expect it to dwindle, not to expand. And so that's what happens. It's like opening those taps and the money just leaks out. So if you go from companion to companion, if you just keep partying and having alcohol, if you get addicted to gambling, which is quite serious, then you can expect to lose all your money. Now, when you look at 
the future and you think, what kind of person is this like? You think, well, this person doesn't have very good qualities. Can you really rely on someone who's a womanizer? Can you rely on someone who becomes an alcoholic? Can you rely on someone who's addicted to gambling? The answer is no. And do you trust someone? All the stories that you hear about grown-ups who have these kinds of addictions, they lose money and they can even steal your money because they're so addicted to either alcohol or women or men or, or even gambling. So these are not good qualities. So if you see it now, you can prevent yourself from becoming addicted. You can prevent yourself from developing a bad reputation and being shunned. And so it's very good. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha says to choose your friends wisely. There'll always be friends there to spend money, but friends kind of disappear when the money goes. So one of the things about choosing good friends is good friends are there in good and bad times. They're not there just simply for the good times to spend the money. And the good friends are always encouraging you not to do bad things. They're always saying, be careful. You know, may maybe we shouldn't do this. That's a wise friend. So this is the way you look at the eight downfall. The Buddha talks about the drawbacks of drinking alcohol in the single of other sutta. The first one is the immediate loss of wealth. And we can see this because of how expensive alcohol is. And the more you drink, the more you spend. The second is the promotion of quarrel. So you often see when people drink, they get into arguments, they get into physical fights. The third is susceptibility to illness. So there is the mental fatigue and, and cloudiness. But then you also could have alcoholic poisoning or in the longer term, organ failure. The fourth is disrepute. So the reputation of someone who's a drunk, someone who indulges, someone who's an alcoholic, it's not a good one. The fifth is indecent exposure. So you lose your inhibitions when you drink and much more than that. And then the sixth is the weakening of wisdom. So when the mind keeps indulging in alcohol, it becomes mentally weak. So you can never really gain or develop wisdom. You go in the opposite direction, madness, mental derangement is what the Buddha says is the fruit of drinking. So it's very good to contemplate this, to see why alcohol may not be a good idea. In the Single of Adha Sutta, the Buddha also has six drawbacks of gambling. So the first is victory breeds enmity. The second is the loser mourns their money. The third is there is immediate loss of wealth. Fourth is a gambler's word carries no weight in public assembly. Fifth, friends and colleagues treat them with contempt. Six, and no one wants to marry a gambler for they think this individual is a gambler. They're not able to support a partner. So these six things are very good to contemplate. If you haven't developed any kind of interest in gambling, don't go towards it. That's the recommendation because there are quite dire consequences. And the other thing to bear in mind is also to look around you, whether it's a womanizer, an alcoholic or a gambler, if you know anyone in your family like this, or you've seen people like this, or you read about them in the news, then you look at how they fall from grace, how they may have been successful and they fall, or they just got such a bad reputation. And that is clearly something that brings downfall. And you don't really want to associate with these kinds of people because you could get smeared in the same way. These are not things that are, that are looked upon very highly. In fact, they're very much frowned upon. And having heard the eighth downfall and understood it, the devas then asked the Buddha about the ninth. And the Buddha says, one who is not content with his own wives is seen among prostitutes, seen among the wives of others. That is a cause of a downfall. So this particular downfall is really about when you want to indulge in sex and when you want to indulge in sexual misconduct. So you want to indulge in prostitutes and you're willing to cheat. Now the Buddha has said that sexual misconduct is actually a very bad thing. And the repercussions of that in this lifetime or the future is hostility, enmity and rivalry. Now, the easiest way to understand this is to look at people around you. So if you know people who are older, 
And we've all heard stories or we know someone in our family who is doing such thing. Then we know that it causes a lot of hurt and harm, whether it's to ourselves or to others. And so when you look at it from the perspective of being on the receiving end of somebody who does this, it can even start out when we're young, when our partners cheat on us, our girlfriends or our boyfriends cheat on us. What is that like? It's not good. We don't like it. And that person is horrible for doing those things. So when you turn that around and you think about in the future, is this something that I want to do? The answer is no, because the impact when you're older, when you do it, is it can break up families. It can lead to loss of wealth. It can also lead to a very bad reputation and you can be blackmailed for doing certain things. So the third party could blackmail you because of it. People could steal from you. If you visit prostitutes, they could steal from you. They could blackmail you. You could catch a disease. You can even catch a disease from any other person in that way. So this is clearly a downfall and it's just something to bear in mind when you're young. Don't develop any bad habits. If you've been on the receiving end of it, then you, you know for yourself that once you've been bitten by this, you often think this is not really something that I want to do to anybody else because you know how horrible it is to have been hurt like that. And so that's a very good way to understand it. Having understood the ninth downfall, the devas then ask about the tenth. And the Buddha says, when a man past his youth marries a girl with budding breasts, he does not sleep with jealousy over her. That is a cause of a downfall. So with this particular downfall, we even see this right now, where men or women who are older, so much older, and they marry someone who is as young as their daughter or their son, or even worse, they marry someone who is as young as their granddaughter or grandson. So this is the type of scenario that we're looking at. And we can see certain stories like this, or maybe we have somebody in our family who is doing this. So when the Buddha says this person does not sleep from jealousy over her, the worry in the person's mind is over whether that person will leave them for a younger person, someone their own age. And maybe they worry that that person is only with them because of their money or the things that they buy them, things like that. So this is something that is already in the world. And I think one of the things when you're young is to really see it for what it is. That when you think about it, somebody the age of your father, your mother, or somebody the age of your grandfather, grandmother, is marrying someone your age, then how does that look to you? That doesn't look right, does it? And although it's prevalent in the world today, like there are some people doing this, it's not to be seen as a good thing. Now, if you have parents or grandparents that are doing this and you see that, you know what that feels like. You have a direct experience about it. And it is the cause for many fights, many uh, quarrels and disharmony in the family, even over inheritance, even over many, many things. So, this is something to bear in mind as a young person. When you look at it, you contemplate it. You think, is this really something that I want to lean towards? How do I feel about it? And when the Buddha says it causes downfall, it is another way that you lose your reputation. People will laugh at you. People will ridicule you. People will think, oh, what's up with that? And also there's a huge loss of wealth. And if you can't sleep out of jealousy, you also lose wealth because you stop paying attention to things that are really important, such as your business and other things. And then you pay too much attention to what's happening with your younger husband or wife. And so that's the cause of a downfall. If you are someone that is going to marry, pick a really suitable person, someone who has good qualities, just like picking good friends. It's very important who you pick as your partner. Having heard and understood the 10th downfall, the devas then asked the Buddha about the 11th. And the Buddha says, if one places in authority a debauched woman, a spendthrift, or a man of similar nature, that is a cause of a downfall. So what the Buddha is referring to here is when you put someone in a position of power to make all the important decisions, 
someone who is a drunk or an alcoholic or someone who is addicted to gambling or someone who spends a lot of money is irresponsible with the money, then that is the cause of a downfall. So it could be a man or a woman, but it's clearly someone who has very bad tendencies, who is irresponsible. Then you really need to make sure you don't put that person in power or in authority because they'll lose it all. That's what will happen. If they run a business, the business will go to ruin. If they are in charge of all the money, all the money will be witted away. So this is something to bear in mind. Now, if you live with parents or family, or you know of friends uh, who have someone in authority like this, someone who has bad habits, someone who is a spendthrift, then you know what that's like. So if you've been on the receiving end of this, then you know what that's like. And so you don't want to be like that because when you're successful, the worst thing is to lose it all by putting the wrong person in charge. So we see this in the news today where businesses appoint the wrong person and then that company goes down or you see families and the head of the family, so it could be the husband or the wife, they're in charge of the money and they have a gambling problem. What happens? The family ends up losing everything, even their home. So this is something for the future to bear in mind. And so what you start doing is you see the link with all the bad tendencies. When you get addicted to the wrong things, then you yourself become this kind of person. So it's really important to learn early and to know what is good and what isn't good. And so you don't set yourself up for failure. Having heard and understood the 11th downfall, they asked the Buddha about the 12th and final downfall. And the Buddha says, if one of little wealth and strong craving is born into a ruling elite family, he aspires to rulership here. That is a cause of a downfall. So this is situations where someone is born to a, a family that has a particular lineage. Usually they're part of the ruling elite and they may not be deserving of power and wealth and authority. And what happens is they have very strong craving. Now, each of us has a little bit of this. And I think we may not be born into ruling elite families, but we think we are more deserving than anything. And so we develop a very strong craving for wealth and power. And we need to be very careful when we do this, whether we have the right reasons for it. So in history, we've seen people who come from elite families and some of the people are undeserving. They haven't educated themselves. They don't have even the right intention to help others because when you rule, you usually are meant to have very altruistic types of intentions. That means it's for the well-being of others. But what we find in the world today as an example is many people who come up in politics, in business, it's more selfish, it's more greedy, greedy for power, greedy for wealth, greedy for selfish needs. And when that happens, you see a lot of corruption, a lot of lying, a lot of deceit. You see all the bad things happen. You see lying, cheating, stealing, killing. They would do anything for these things. And that is, a, that is really a downfall. So what we can learn from this is when we have strong craving towards wealth and power and authority and status, we need to make sure that we have the right intention and we need to make sure that we are deserving, that we have worked hard for these things and our intent is right and then it will come to us. But if we aspire to leadership and rulership and we don't have the, the right credentials, we don't have the right intent, then we need to be very cautious. And usually what the Buddha talks about when it comes to leading, he talks about virtue, he talks about generosity, he talks about having all the good things, knowing right from wrong, in, being influenced by wholesome, not unwholesome. Otherwise, it leads to this kind of downfall because what happens is you get overwhelmed with the strong desire to lead, but then you would do anything for it. You would not be virtuous. And when you have someone like that leading, it leads to the downfall of the world, the whole population, whoever you're leading, whether it's a company or a country or the world. 
So if you take the example of the world today, there are many people who are leading, who are corrupt, who lie, who are willing to kill, who are willing to steal, and therefore we are where we are right now. There are too many unvirtuous people in the world. And so downfall is associated with that. The Buddha concludes the teaching by saying, having examined these cases of downfall in the world, a wise person, noble, endowed with vision, passes on to an auspicious world. So this is the recommendation of the Buddha. Look at those around you particularly the grown-ups, look at where they are. Are they successful or are they in downfall? Have they been ruined? And look at the behavior that took them there. Look out into the world at what's in the news, how people have fallen from grace. Because all these 12 things that the Buddha talks about, they're the recipe for disaster. So if you follow these 12 things, you're on the road to ruin. You will not be successful or if you are successful it's for a limited time so there's something very important in what the buddha is saying in fact if you think what should be taught in schools this is the type of thing that needs to be taught quite often people don't realize that the world is in decline because of lack of virtue being stingy not knowing wholesome from unwholesome being willing to break all the precepts in order to succeed, but then they fall. So if you wish to be a success in the world, you need to go against this. You need to associate with the wise people, not the bad ones. You need to be able to stop yourself from developing bad habits, bad tendencies, to not go along with peer pressure, to be courageous in the face of people saying, this is fun when you know eventually it leads to downfall. So these are the things that the Buddha says. They can be very, very helpful. And if you want to contribute to turning back the world from decline, then if you are someone who is virtuous, trying to lead a virtuous life, you are turning back against where the world is heading. So the world is heading towards more and more decline because of the lack of virtue, because of the stinginess, because of all the things that people do with body, speech and mind, even when things are bad, how they respond is, is through being unvirtuous. And so it gets worse. So more killing, more stealing, more lying, more sexual misconduct, more intoxicants. It's a recipe for disaster. So this is a very powerful teaching. The idea is not just to take it and accept it as moot, to investigate. As the Buddha says, examine the cases in the world, look at the downfall. And so if you really see it, take this as the recipe for disaster and the one that you don't want to lead. The counterpart to this is the Mahamangala. And at some point we will go through that as well. And it will be a wonderful contrast. The good thing about this is if you lead a pure life, a life that is at least trying your best to keep precepts, to be generous in the world, to know what is wholesome, to associate with the wise, then you can expect a good result in this lifetime and beyond. And if you go towards more of the Buddha's teaching, then it can be more than that. You can make progress on the path. So what is said at the end of this teaching is, is that the Devas, they actually had a lot of breakthroughs. A lot of them entered the stream, a lot of them made progress. So that is very heartening. We've now come to the end of our session. And on this last slide, we have the 12 things that bring downfall to a person. What I would recommend is if you really find this teaching powerful, get together with your parents or with your friends and talk about it, really talk about it. Those who are interested in Dhamma, get together and talk about it and really see whether you can find examples in the world or even from your own examples of people that you know where this applies, because then it starts to take seed that you really understand where the Buddha is coming from and you can prevent this kind of downfall in the future. Now, one of the things to always bear in mind is if you have been on the receiving end of any of this, whether it's from a family member or from friends or, or things like that, then you know for yourself that 
You don't like that. It's harmful. It hurts. And so that's a very good way of encouraging yourself to not want to do this now or in the future. So that's something to bear in mind. If you remember from Venerable Mahamogalana in the Anumana Sutta, that's how you actually practice. And even when we look at things like the Vatupama Sutta, the Karaniya Metta Sutta, what we've always said is, look in the mirror, really take your own examples and see. So this is what I would encourage. Buddha's words are there for contemplation. Meditation is about contemplation, being able to directly experience and see for yourself this truth. And so the more you do it, the more skilled you become and the more wise choices you can make. This is for your own well-being. This is for your own success. We can end our session here. I wish all of you to achieve success and not failure, not downfall. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from downfall, free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem, wishing you well. Teruan Saranai.